Okay, so I messed up. I got here this morning and I pulled out my notes for uh, Sukkot. We've been working through the feasts in Leviticus chapter 23. We have covered all of the spring feasts and we've seen how Jesus fulfilled each one of the spring feasts. The feast of Passover, he was our Paschal lamb. Uh, the feast of unleavened bread, he was without sin, thus making him perfect. Uh, the fe feast of first fruits, Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Paul even makes an allusion to this when he says he was the firstborn of the dead. <clears throat> and then Pentecost, or, or Shavuot, yeah, Shavuot, um, 50 days after uh, the feasts, um, we have the celebration of the birth of the church. And, and what we call in the Greek, it's, it's Pentecost, 50 days. In, in Hebrew, it's Shavuot, seven sevens plus one. Uh, so we've seen that all of those have been fulfilled in the first coming of our Lord Jesus. And then we have the period of summer. And that's the period that we're in right now. Okay? Be between the first coming and the second coming in what's been called the church age or the age of grace. Um, but there's the fall feasts that are coming. And we, they start with the Feast of Trumpets, okay, which is Rosh Hashanah, and, and the Jews use that as their new year. And then there's also, uh, we, we see that, that the trumpet is used in all of the prophecies about Jesus' return, whether it be his um, coming in the rapture or his second coming. Both of those are going to be declared by the blowing of the trumpet. Well, if you look at these and you go, well, wait a minute, it says the last trumpet. Uh, we, we talked about how in the Feast of Trumpets they do a series of trumpet blasts and, and they go in sequence for 99 times and then the 100th uh, trumpet blast, it's called the last trumpet blast and that's when the, the sounder will give it everything he's got for as long as he can. Okay? That's the last trumpet. I don't think when the authors in the New Testament are saying, you know, with the last trumpet sound, I don't think they're going, that's the last one forever because we see other passages that clearly indicate that trumpets are going to be blown after that point. I think they're referring to the, the Hagarol, the, the last trumpet blast for the Feast of Trumpets. That one that's as loud as you can make it, as long as you can make it. Okay? And then we, we see the ten days of preparation where the Jews are called to get themselves ready for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. We talked about this at great length, the process that, that they had to go through. The high priest had to purify himself and his family before he could go in to, to bring the, the purification for the nation of Israel. We talked about this, this is not a personal Repentance, this is not a personal atonement. This is the national atonement. Okay? You're still responsible for your sins. But this is the day that God called them all together for national atonement. Alright? <clears throat> and then we started a couple weeks back on the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Tents. Um, here's my problem. I had a series of notes going through the actual process uh, of how they would celebrate this that were apart from my notes uh, that, that I do regularly through Sunday, and, and those notes are at home. And I can tell you what was on the notes, I just can't remember all the passages. So I'm going to push that back to next week, because everything that God gave us in the, in the feasts is a symbol of something. Uh, I started off this series saying that the feasts were God's telling of his story of the redemption of man starting with the Paschal Lamb and ending with God dwelling with man. Okay? And we see as we go through the process of looking at everything that was done, we see how God has moved to co complete and fulfill His plan of redemption. Okay? And we're going to wrap that up with the, the Feast of Trumpets. Where we actually, I'm sorry, the Feast of Tabernacles. We have one more feast that I'm going to touch on. Um, that the, the Feast of Purim. Uh, we'll talk about that later. It's not one of the feasts in Leviticus 23, uh, but it is one of the feasts that the Jews celebrate. So, um, so I'm going to push that off till next week when hopefully I'll get my act together and get everything in one place. 
Uh, but I do have uh, quite a few Ask the Pastor questions that I've been putting off trying to get the series done. Uh, I've got five or six of them today, so if, if you will allow me, I'd like to address some of these, and uh, then next week we'll move back into the Feast of Tabernacles. So, <clears throat> is it okay for a Christian to meditate and do yoga? Yes and no. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> okay. First, in order to answer this question properly, we've got to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Okay, what do you mean by meditate and yoga? Okay, so the scripture tells us that we are to meditate, actually several times in the book of Psalms, that it says we are to meditate. Okay, but what does meditate mean? Well, I, I went to our old faithful standby for all definitions, uh, Mr. Webster. And this is what Webster's has to say um, as far as meditation. One, to engage in contemplation or reflection. Two, to engage in mental exercise such as concentration on one's breathing or repetition uh, of a mantra for the purpose of reaching a heightened level of spiritual awareness. Now, the Hebrew word is higayon, and that means to meditate or to muse. It actually also means a resounding sound. Um, so let, let's try and put these things together so you understand why I'm answering the way that I am. Um, I believe that absolutely a Christian should meditate according to the first definition of what, what uh, Webster gave us, to, to ponder, to contemplate, to reflect. Uh, I, I think, though, it's not open-ended, okay? I think there needs to be a focus on it. Otherwise, you're just vegging, <coughs> okay? Um, when, when we are called to meditate, uh, David actually writes, uh, let's see, Psalm 1914. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So he's, he's referring to meditation. Um, but he also uh, says that we are to meditate Psalm 1, verse 2, on the law, the, the written word of God, okay? As much as people tend to, to veg and, 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 you know, Christy has an amazing, absolutely amazing, God has blessed her with amazing gifts. Um, two of them I'm always amazed at. She can fall asleep en route to the pillow. <laughs> Which, that is a huge blessing, okay? For those of you that are like me, that you're laying in bed watching the sun come up, wondering why you're not sleeping, that ability is incredible, okay? Um, the other thing that she can do is she can think of nothing, or she can not think of something, or I'm not sure how that works. But usually, it's the woman that asks the man, what are you thinking about? And he goes, nothing. Uh, with Christian, I, it's reversed. A lot of times, she'll ask me what I'm thinking about, and I'll lie. <laughs> well, not much. Because she makes fun of the things I think about. <laughs> okay? Um, we're, we are not created to exist in a vacuum, okay? I believe that we are called to meditate, we are called to focus, we are called to recite, we are called to memorize and commit to memory the Word of God. One of the things that I think has put the church in America in such dire straits is that we have forgotten, we've neglected the Word of God. Um, it used to be that people would be able to quote entire passages we're a church now that people struggle to quote a verse. Uh, we do not have an intimate familiarity with the Word of God. And I think a part of that reason is where, where you know, when I was growing up, we were called the 15-minute generation because, you know, that's about as long as our attention span would last. I don't think this generation is a 15-second generation because mm -hmm. all the answers are right there in front of you. You don't even have to type anymore. You can say, hey, Google, where is he? <laughs> is he gone? Okay. Josh and Mackenzie blessed Christy and I with a, a Google thing. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. What's it called? Google Home. A what? Google Home. It's my home. <coughs> Google's a guest. <laughs> but you have to say, hey, Google, to get it to do anything. Our grandkids found that out. Oh. And, and so they're like, hey, Google, what does an alligator say? And evidently, Google understands poor grammar. <laughs> and, it, and it will make an alligator sound. Well, Cohen has not yet fashioned the words to, to sequence, hey, Google. Mm -hmm. He runs around yelling at Google. <laughs> and then he gets mad and he looks at me like it's my fault. I'm like, I don't know what you want it to do. What do you want it to do? I'll tell it. And, and so he walks around and, and he points his finger at it and he yells at it and it doesn't ever respond. <laughs> okay. Um, we are, we have things so easy for us now. Um, if, if, you know, growing up, I had to go to a library and actually pull books off the shelf and research. I had to know a card catalog. And, and, you know, the, the teacher would ask for a five-page report on something that I could only find a paragraph and a half about in the library. <coughs> Gosh, I got so good at saying things over and over again in different ways. And now, you know, the, the, the kids are like, type, 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 thunk, and there's a scholarly paper on that subject, and, and there's, everything is right there in front of them. And, and there's, we're so impatient. We, we don't have the... the attention span to focus on anything for very long. And we've reduced the value of God's word to so low on our list of priorities <coughs> that we don't take it seriously. You know? Um, we need to know intimately the word of God. That is the first and primary way that he has chosen to communicate himself to us. Okay? So, We've got to get into that, and part of that process is meditating on the Word. Um, you know, you can do things way back when, when Christy and I, uh, in our pride and our arrogance, we were doing a Bible quiz at a church, and we wanted to show them how good we were. We memorized the book of James. And I don't say that to, to, to impress anybody, because it was actually sin that led me to memorize the book of James. Thank God I memorized the book of James, but it was completely the wrong motive, because I wanted to show those people who had judged Christy and I how much better we were with the familiarity of the Word of God. Um, so we memorized the book of James. Well, how did we do it? We got a tape of the book of James, and we listened to it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? We dedicated ourselves to learning that. But not wanting to prove myself to anybody anymore, how come I'm still not driven by that same drive? You know, the Jews, by the time a child was 12 years old, he would have committed the entire Torah to memory. First five books of the Bible. Five books of the Bible. And they're not even short books. Okay? So, should we meditate? Absolutely. On the Word of God. Should we do yoga? No. <laughs> This is why I say yes and no. Now, my understanding of yoga is that it is conjointly knit together with transcendental meditation or some sort of meditation apart from Scripture. Now, can you do stretches and meditate on the Word of God? Have at it. But yoga is associated with something that is not God. Okay? I don't care your open warrior stance, your down dog stance, or I don't even know what this stuff is. Okay, so if I got those wrong, don't, please don't be offended. But, but, you know, if you want to stretch and you want the word of God playing so that you're getting it into your soul, absolutely, I would encourage you to do it. Okay? I would discourage heartily, as a matter of fact, I would exhort you to avoid yoga, where it teaches you to focus on nothing or, or on attain, attaining a higher state in your brain, a higher state in your spirit. Let God bring you there, okay? You know what happens when you think about nothing? I don't know, I've never been able to do it, <laughs> okay? So if one of you has done it, let me know. So, yes, absolutely, and no, definitely. Number two, does the use of uh, marijuana as medicine coexist with God's plan for our lives? Now this is a uh, this is an interesting question. I know people that marijuana has helped tremendously. 
for medicinal purposes. I've seen cases where the use of marijuana has, has helped people with Parkinson's. Uh, I know there are a number of places where it is used medically. Um, I, this is not about <coughs> the pros or cons of marijuana as a, med, as a medicinal drug. Okay, so what I'm saying is not about that. Here's the problem that we have as believers. Okay. As believers, we are called to obey the government that is put over us. Okay. Up until the point, and well, there's actually another question that I'll address a little bit further in, up to the point where it calls us to do something apart from the Word of God. Okay. Right now, the law in this country, the federal government, forbids the use of marijuana. I know there are states that have allowed the use of it medicinally. I know there are states that have allowed the use of it recreationally. That's irrelevant. Okay? Because the law of the land, the federal law of these United States of America, says that it is a prohibited drug. So, as a believer, my stance is no, we don't touch it. Now, I know that it works for people. I know people personally that, that it has helped tremendously. I know people that should probably be on it. <laughs> Just chill, dude. Relax, okay? But right now, the federal government has said no. If you want it to, to be put into place, work through the federal government to get it done, okay? As a medicine. Recreationally, no. No. You should not be doing anything. You should not be doing any alcohol, any drug of any kind, anything like that that alters your state of mind. Okay? Because God has called us. He says, do not be drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Okay? Now, Proverbs talks about wine and beer being used as a medicine. Okay? Um, we've got a lot of self-medicators. Okay? <laughs> So, recreationally, I'm sorry, I, I don't see Scripture gives us that room, okay? But neither do I see Scripture giving, it, giving us that room, you know, with anything that would alter our mind, whether it be mushrooms or alcohol or tobacco, caffeine. I, I think we need to be careful. We like to pick and choose the, the no-nos, but we hold desperately on to our yes-yes, okay? So anything that alters our mind, anything that could in any way impede our relationship with God, set it aside. Okay? So that's, that's number two. That leads us to number three. Does God want us to trust the government? <clears throat> I, I have no idea what you're asking me here. <clears throat> I'm not sure what is meant by trust, so I'm going to answer it with what I think, okay? Um, first, Scripture says that there is no authority appointed except that which has been appointed by God, okay? We have two authors in the New Testament that write this, one of them being Paul, the other being Peter. Both of them telling us that we should submit ourselves to the authorities that are placed over us because they are appointed by God. Now, if we really believe this, it's going to affect how we think about things because not only was President Trump appointed by God, for those of you that think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread, you're going, yes, I knew it, but so was Obama. And for those of you that look at Trump and going, what an idiot. Obama was appointed as well, so was FDR, so was Abraham Lincoln, so was, uh, all of them were appointed by God, but that also leads us to Hitler, and Stalin, and Mao, okay? God appointed all of them for his purposes. Now the thing that we have got to remember in this is our brains are so very, very small, and God is so very, very big, okay? We don't understand all the purposes of God. We just, we are, our brains are too small, okay? When God declares something to be so, it is so, it fulfills his purposes. I mean, I can look and I can rationalize some of the things about Hitler. I mean, if Hitler hadn't done, uh, you know, the, 
the, the murder, the mass murder of the genocide of, of millions of Jews, Israel would not be the home of the Jews today. And it cost in excess of six million Jews for that to happen. But then we look at Stalin, who murdered at least that many Jews. I, 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 my brain is too small. I don't understand the purposes of God. I don't understand why God puts certain people into places. When I look at it and I go, they did absolutely no good for anybody. I, I, I really don't get it. But I know this, I don't have to trust the government. I trust God. Okay. And when the government does things that, that are flying contrary to the word of God, I trust God. Okay. Say, well, when, when is it appropriate to, to go into rebellion against the authorities? Well, I don't think it's ever appropriate to go in rebellion against the authority. I think it's appropriate to go in opposition to a particular doctrine or a particular policy or a particular thing. Uh, one of the things that I, so breaks my heart um, is the number of Christians that say absolutely horrible and disgusting things about our president because he disagrees with their politics. <coughs> hey, look, folks, you're bad-mouthing God because God chose that person to be in that place. Disagree with the politics, absolutely. Absolutely. There are some, some policies in this country that absolutely amaze and astound me, and it breaks my heart. Okay? But we respect the position because God has put it there. Okay? We disagree with the policy, but don't speak with, with vitriol or, 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 or animosity uh, against the person because you're speaking against God's representative. Okay? Absolutely, we stand against, uh, you know, when we do the life chain, every year we're out there at life chain. And I'm so blessed to see uh, when people come out to life chain with their children, because that's what it's all about, is children and, and the life that, that is within them. Uh, I absolutely will oppose in any way that is possible to me, in line with God's word, any sort of abortion. Okay, But I'm not going to speak to discredit the person that is in that office. Policy, yes. Person, no. Okay. So does God want us to trust the government? I think the better question is, can we trust God despite the government? Mm -hmm. And that's whether it be for you or against you. Okay? So that's, that's my answer for that one. We'll do one more, and then I'm going to wrap it up for today. Um, these two kind of go together. Hmm. These all three kind of go together. I'll do the easy one. We've got several questions dealing with creation, um, <clears throat> and they're all kind of linked. I'm just going to deal with one of them today. It says, where do dinosaurs fit into creation? Day five. There you go. <laughs>